Last year at the Grand Prix of Cleveland, Alex Zanardi and Gilles de Ferran put on a superb display of wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing to settle the win. First, the Italian grabbed the lead on the last lap, then overshot the corner, allowing de Ferran to make the final pass and claim his second career victory. This summer, the finishes have been even more frantic. Two races ago in Detroit, Greg Moore came from third to first on the final lap around the Belle Isle track. Then in Portland, Mark Blundell, Gilles de Ferran and Raoul Bozell produced the closest finish in series history. Today, the attention turns to Cleveland. Hello and a very warm and sunny welcome from Ben Edwards and Jeremy Shaw to the 16th running of the Cleveland Grand Prix on the City Airport. A bumpy, fast and demanding track where Jacques Villeneuve won just two years ago on his way to the 1995 IndyCar title. Today we have five former Grand Prix drivers in the top six on the grid, the interloper being Gilles de Ferran, who spent most of his formative years in European motorsport. It's a glorious day for a race, temperatures in the mid-twenties, spectators smothered in suntan lotion, but Jeremy, the main concern on the driver's minds is trying to make it safely through that first corner. <laughs> yes, it's awfully wide. It's up to 120 feet wide here, you can see on the left-hand side of the picture, and it narrows down really into the one or two car width. Here's a, an incident actually before the green flag a couple of years ago between Paul Tracy on the onboard camera there and Andre Ribeiro. And there's Ribeiro again in front of De Ferran, so all action at the first corner. So that's what we've got to be looking for in today's race. Will they make it safely through that first corner? The very wide main straight, one of the runways here on the airport and what a strange track this is in many ways very unusual to use an airport as a race circuit but now in its 16th year it's proved to be a highly popular track for the spectators and they have turned out in massive numbers we had something like 60,000 people here yesterday and we've got quite a few more than that here today again looking down there at turn one and then the scene around you can say see Lake Erie in the background of that picture and quite a few boats out there enjoying the opportunity to sail close up to the track and get quite a good view yeah fantastic and actually the big ferry we can out see out there as well with uh, it actually the decks are absolutely lined with people a fantastic view from the shores there of, of uh, lake erie and uh, here at uh, on the racetrack itself it's really as you say it's much hotter today and much more humid it's going to be uh, a very warm day indeed in the office for alex and and his uh, compatriots here this afternoon. Alex Zanardi will start on pole position and there's the man who will be alongside him on the front row. The very same two drivers that battled for the win on the final lap last year, Gilles de Ferran and Alex Zanardi, who also started on the front row together here this year in Long Beach. Well, it's going to be a big battle between the two of them, but Zanardi, who was second fastest in this morning's warm-up, has had the edge over just about everybody this weekend so far and proved that by taking pole position by over half a second. The points at the moment, though, see Zanardi down in fifth position. Now on 70 points, one ahead of Jimmy Vassar, thanks to getting pole here, but Paul Tracy leads by five points over fellow Canadian Greg Moore with Michael Andretti in a threatening-looking third position. And remember, Michael starts on the second row of the grid here today alongside Britain, Mark Blundell, who won the last round at Portland and who is superbly fired up to do well here this weekend again. A great qualifying effort from Mark Blundell. In fact, it's the best of his IndyCar career so far, and he will start right behind these two. You're on board with Gilles de Ferran, who lines up second on the grid, and Alex Zanardi, and they're just going out there to start the first of their parade and warm-up laps. Three times around the track they will go before we get the green flag here and uh, everybody seems to be moving away uh, solidly uh, away from the grid there is the pole sitter Alex Zanardi uh, most people here are choosing the option tires at the soft of the two compound tires here and it's going to be interesting to see whether those tires stand up here to the heat actually for the fast ends uh, their, their option tire is really uh, the only the the inside of the car the right hand side of the, of, uh, of the car the tyres on the right-hand side, I should say, are, excuse me, are softer slightly than the uh, primary tyres. But it's going to be interesting to see whether they stand up to the heat and humidity this afternoon. Let's take a look at the grid then. Alex Zanardi, his last win came in the third race of the season at Long Beach. And alongside him, the defending Cleveland champion, starting from the front row for the third time of the 97 season. Mark Blundell, his first career win coming just two weeks ago at Portland. This is his best career start. Michael Andretti, his only win, came here in 91. Christian Fittipaldi had a great fourth place in Portland on his comeback. Maurizio Guterman has led three different races this season, but is yet to take a victory.
victory. Behind them on row four, Brian Herter, who's been very competitive this weekend. He was fastest in the morning warm-up, second fastest in Friday's qualifying. Andre Ribeiro, first time out in a Reynard, and his best qualifying performance of the year. Bobby Rahol, local man, is in ninth position. His first career win came in the inaugural event here in 1982, and Paul Tracy, the championship leader, is alongside him. Dario Franchitti's back in 11th place, but fastest of the eight drivers making their first Cleveland start. Walter Salas was fourth fastest this morning in the warm-up. Greg Moore is just five points away from the top of the championship table at the moment. Raul Bazell had a fantastic third-place finish in Portland. Jimmy Vassa had his first DNF in Portland when hit by Parker Johnston. Scott Pruitt makes his 100th career start today. He was third fastest this morning in the warm-up. Behind them, Parker Johnston, who's had five point scoring finishes in the first half of the season, but it's been a bit disappointing. But not as disappointing as Alan Juniors, his worst starts in 1995 at Nazareth. He's got some work to do. Patrick Carpentier's finished every race this season so far. Alongside him is Michel Jourdain from Mexico in his second race in the Reynard. PJ Jones is the top of the Toyota powered cars. He's got another Toyota powered car alongside him, the car of Mad Max on his first visit here to Cleveland. Then it's Juan Fangio overcoming some reliability problems in the last couple of races. Richie Hearn with a much modified Lola chassis this weekend. They've made an awful lot of changes to the back end of the car particularly. And the same for Adrian Fernandez, Lola, but it doesn't seem to be having the desired effect just yet. So Adrian Fernandez lines up on the row 13 alongside Hiro Matsushita, who finished in the points here in 93. We've got the German driver, Arndt Meyer, back out again this weekend. And a new boy, Charlie Nierberg. His first start with the kart series, although he's raced in Formula Supervia here in the past. So the car's coming around on these uh, parade laps now. And just looking at the shape of that grid, interesting, as I mentioned at the top of the programme there, Jeremy, that we've got quite a few drivers with Grand Prix experience who really have gone well in the qualifying here. Yes, yeah, astonishing, isn't it? I just hadn't realised that until you, until you mentioned it there. But five, five ex-Grand Prix drivers in the top six, that is very interesting indeed. I don't think there's anything more than a coincidence in that. Um, but, but it, is, it uh, is a track where the driver really can make a difference, isn't it, as Alex was telling us? Yeah, he was yesterday, wasn't he? He was saying that here you can, you can really take some chances and, and try and get the edge off the corners, so to speak, almost literally. And you can see there how wide these runways are and through onto the taxiway as they're going through. That's turns three and four as they're sweeping right and then left and back onto the other runway there. It is a fascinating track, and there are all the grandstands at the top of the picture. Uh, you can see the whole track from any of those grandstands. It is a, a wonderful place for the race fans here in Cleveland. It is, yes, and a very popular part of the whole event. Again, you can see uh, the boats in the bottom are part of the picture as well, who are getting a good view. Cleveland has really gone through a, a rebuild process, a renovation process. It nearly went bankrupt as a city at the end of the 1970s, and in fact, having the race here has been a major part of the of the rebuild process hasn't it yeah three or four years ago there was there was talk about taking the race away from cleveland the the the, uh, the calendar was getting cluttered up and quite a few races within the midwest and uh, cleveland came very close to losing its race well the whole city got behind uh, a bring the race back to cleveland project and uh, and they were effective they raised the money to, to get the purse up to up to scratch so to speak and uh, the whole city was behind getting this race back again they really wanted the event here and, and the fans here are talking, uh, you know, with, with, with their money today by buying the Grand Sussex the plates. It's packed. It is packed. There are people just everywhere as we're walking down to the booth trying to fight the way through the crowd. But it's fantastic to see and everybody all set up to watch what should be a tremendous round 10 to the championship, a championship that has been so, so close over the last few races. And in fact, this year, we've yet to see a win that is over four seconds. It's that close this season. A look then at the track and the 2.1 mile track as they've decided this year. It was 2.3 miles last year and they actually haven't changed the track at all, so that's slightly strange. Yeah, cold winters they have up here in this part of the world and perhaps this track has shrunk a little bit, quarter of a mile somehow off the race. It's awfully difficult to measure it really. If you go around the inside of the track, it's quite a different than if you go around the outside line of the track, so to speak. So uh, quite different there. And of course that, that affects the fuel allocation for these cars. It's allocated on the basis of achieving 1.85 miles per gallon so the cars start with 35 gallons on board and the rest of the fuel the balance of the fuel is in the pit uh, in the pit lane here and it's, it's going to be pretty close here the pit windows here are fairly close they should be able to do it on two stops 
But this track, not normally a lot of yellows, and uh, it's, uh, there's a very tight window there to make it on two pit stops. We're getting ready for the start now, Jeremy. The car's beginning to line up now. This is on the penultimate straight. There are two straights connected by a, a right-left sequence as they come past the pit, so they're just coming down. Notice on the right there are cones there. That marks the entrance to the pit lane. Yesterday there was a concrete wall there. They've moved it. They've decided it was uh, too dangerous to have the concrete wall there. So now it's just a line of cones, and we're coming around to start the first of 90 laps here at Cleveland. Watch the drama at the first corner. Look how wide the track is here as we go for green, and Alex Zanardi makes a great getaway. Watch on the left-hand side of the picture, Fiddy Pauldy trying to get down the inside of Mark Blundell. Blundell turns in, keeps it nice and wide. Brian Herter trying to squeeze through as well. But fortunately, the first few cars get through safely. Somebody just oh, touches the grass on the exit of turn one. But remarkably, it looks as though we've got everybody through the corner safely without any dr major dramas. And Alex Zanardi is the race leader from Gilles de Ferran in second place. And against everybody's expectations, they made it through turn one. Tremendous stuff there. What a, a great driving. I mean, everybody was prepared to give them each other room there's no point in making a mistake on the first corner they know that all you can really do is lose the race there so uh, it's uh, a great start by Alex Zanardi brought the pace, the pace up fairly slowly got a good jump able to make a good start there Christian Filippoldi an excellent start there from row three and gets up a couple of places to run in third place on his opening lap Yes, but you can see they were being careful. Blundell particularly decided not to chop the nose off uh, Fittipaldi's car. He had a chance. Oh, Fittipaldi there, under braking, heavy braking there as they come into that uh, right-left for the first time, taken in fourth gear at over 100 miles an hour minimum speed through that corner. Now down to the hairpin. They drop down to around 55 miles an hour here. Down to second gear, and Mark Blundell behind Christian Fittipaldi there. Filippoldi in third, Blundell in fourth place, then it's Brian Herter in fifth, Michael Antrol, and it uh, looks as though Brian Herter's going for a move on Mark Blundell, and it looks as though he's got the inside line, in fact, gets past quite easily there in the end, and Blundell not as quick out of the corner as he would have liked, and he's now being pushed hard by Michael Andretti. You ride on board with the former champion, and Blundell seems to have some sort of trouble, it shouldn't be this easy, but look at Paul Tracy! Tracy's got up the inside of Michael Andretti, and Tracy gets past both of them! Fantastic move from the Canadian, who didn't start that brilliantly, he was down in 10th place on the grid, but now Michael Andretti has a little look at getting back past the Penske. Tracy shuts the door, and as they come out of turn eight and onto the straight, Tracy just with the advantage over Michael Andretti, both of them having moved past Mark Blundell, who really is not going that quickly in the early stages. I wonder what his trouble is, but it's clear that the car is not running as effectively as it did in yesterday's qualifying. Strange, isn't it? Uh, he, he, he was especially a little bit of concern to me this morning about rear tyre wear and particularly with it being so hot and there goes Bobby Rahal down the inside of Mark Blundell as well so back another place now Mark Blundell started third already back to eighth position and we've only got two laps in the books and, and he's got uh, Dario Franchitti right behind him now as well Dario's running in ninth place there you are on board with Dario Franchitti and now he's got Mark Blundell in his sights and Mark really does seem to be struggling in the early laps here put in that uh, fine qualifying performance yesterday right towards the end of the qualifying session put it in third place he had a couple of uh, races this year where he qualified in fifth position at the start of the season but that was his uh, best effort so far but the car really is not working as well as he would like now on board with Dario Franchitti he had some troubles in qualifying yesterday they had a cut tyre they weren't allowed to go back